near Hollywood, California, under the preaching of a young evangelist. He was very different and unusual, and his crowd started very sparse, but over the course of several weeks grew into thousands and then hundreds of thousands. Many Hollywood celebrities would come out to hear this young evangelist who wore pistachio-colored suits with flaming red ties and preached with a distinct southern accent as he proclaimed the message of believing in Jesus. Because so many thousands of people were coming to hear him, eventually the media picked up on this young evangelist and came out to interview him and to discover more about this young man who was from the hills of North Carolina. It was evident that God was up to something, and soon his ministry blossomed into crusade after crusade after crusade after crusade, and now, uh, almost 100 years of age, uh, most of the world known as, of, of the known world has probably heard the name Billy Graham. Has anyone ever heard Billy Graham preach in person? in this room. Put your hand up. Okay, so I've heard Billy Graham in person. Uh, a few of you out there. Has anyone ever heard Billy Graham preach on TV? Okay, a lot of you. Has anyone never heard of Billy Graham? Probably not anyone. And if you have not, you probably would be embarrassed to raise your hand right now after everything I just said about him, right? <clears throat> this young evangelist named Billy Graham um, started a religious movement that spread throughout the United States and eventually around the world. We are jumping back into a series that we call the Belief Project. It is a study on the Gospel of John. Uh, we began this series a couple of months ago, and I told you that it's going to be an ongoing series in the life of City Church for probably an extended period of time that will jump in and out of the Gospel of John and put some other series in between uh, so that we don't just spend all of our time in the Gospel of John, but we will be in the book of John a lot. So if you have a Bible, turn to the Gospel of John. You're going to see how all of this makes sense in a moment, uh, but we are a Bible teaching church here at City Church, I want you to hear the Bible. We're going to teach from the Bible. We believe that the Bible has the ability through the Holy Spirit to change your heart and life, uh, to connect you to the truth of God. And so we try to spend as much time in the Word as we can teaching you the Bible. So we're going to drill down in the Gospel of John this morning. And in our text today, we're going to look at a first century preacher that was a lot like a young Billy Graham. He was in his 30s. Um, he dressed strangely. It wasn't pistachio-colored suits and flaming red ties. And no, it wasn't skinny jeans. He actually dressed in camel skin, the animal, the hair of wild animals. And his diet uh, was equally as weird and strange as he ate locust and wild honey. And he came out of the desert preaching a powerful message. And people flocked to hear him. Droves of people left the nearby cities to come out into the desert to hear this wild and crazy guy preach his message of repentance. Now, if you know anything about a desert climate, you know that it's not comfortable to leave the coolness of your home to go out into an arid desert climate, much less to sit and hear someone preach and call you to repentance. But droves and droves and thousands of people flooded into the desert to hear this young man preach to the point that it attracted the attention of the religious elite of his day, and they sent out a delegate of their own to question this young man with a unique message. And what we learn in our text this morning speaks to our role as followers of Jesus. Now, John the Apostle, who is different than John the Baptizer that we'll read about in our text, this is the disciple of John that wrote the Gospel of John. He was one of the disciples of Jesus. He's telling the story of John the Baptizer, same name, different man. But John has already introduced us to the Baptizer in our prologue series. We read it in chapter 1, verse 6. Let me recap what the 
disciple said in those verses, he says, There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to bear witness about the light. And then he tells us down in verse 15, John bore witness about him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me because he was before me. We said back in our prologue series that John the baptizer was not pulling a Dr. Seuss and speaking in riddles. What he was saying is, even though Jesus appeared on the scene after me, he is the supreme king of the universe, so he is ranked ahead of me. So we pick up our story today and we see what John was saying in those first verses, that the role of the baptizer was to be a witness to the light, to point people to Jesus. Today we see that role fleshed out in his every day life. And we ask ourselves the question as we go through the text, what does John teach us about our role? What does John teach us in 2016 as modern day Jesus followers? What does he teach us about pointing people to Jesus? Let's pick up in verse 19. And this is the testimony, so this is the life story of John. When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem, so they're coming from the holy city, from the capital, they ask him, who are you? And he confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they ask him, what then? Are you Elijah? And he said, I am not. Are you the prophet? And he answered, no. So the first thing we see about pointing people to Jesus from the life of John the baptizer, it is important for us to recognize, first and foremost, who we are not. John kind of answers their question strangely, right? John the baptizer faced one of the most difficult struggles of a spotlight person, a person that has the attention of other people, people who have come out to hear him teach and preach, and he faces this temptation of attention, of getting the attention of people. Large crowds have gathered to hear this guy speak. I mean, this is every speaker's dream, that people are leaving the comfort of their own homes, to come and hear this desert proclaimer. And they are flocking by droves. Now, we live in a culture that is obsessed with celebrities. Large crowds will gather anytime there's a celebrity, even celebrities that just make their way, you know, going to the store or going to a movie. They'll be flocked by droves of people. This past week when I was uh, flying in from a, a business trip, um, I saw on the airplane Evander Holyfield, who was uh, in one of the greatest all-time fights of all time against Mike Tyson, and um, he's the one that had his ear bitten off by Iron Mike. Um, and so my immediate reaction is, hey, you're Evander Holyfield. It's like, man, I used to watch your fights and enjoyed watching them. Can I snap a picture with you? I was one of those guys like flocking to the celebrities. I've, I've done a lot of traveling the last several years of my life, and I've seen some quote-unquote famous people in airports and different places, and um, people have a tendency to, to flock to them. We are a, a culture obsessed with celebrities. When you stand in line to buy your groceries, you are flooded with stories about celebrities, some true, most of them untrue. When you uh, turn on the television, you are flooded with shows about celebrities, what they're doing, where they're eating, where they're having children, what type of relationships they're involved in, what movies they're going to be involved in, what TV shows they're on, uh, what they're singing, what records are coming out, what they're producing. We are a culture obsessed with celebrity status. And John's temptation was his own greatness, even in our everyday lives. We get consumed. How many people are following me? How many likes did I get? We're obsessed with someone clicking their thumb on our picture, on our status. We're obsessed, aren't we? Going back and checking. Well, man, I got 112 likes. I don't think I have 112 followers. So my kids have more likes on their Instagram stuff than I even have, like, friends. So... Uh, but we're a culture obsessed with likes and follows and friends and status, and we get obsessed with our own greatness. And John was an enigma. He was a riddle. He generated publicity. 
I mean, the magazines, People Magazine was wanting an interview from this guy. Who are you? John the Baptizer. Who are you? Now, this is an important question to ask. Who are you? How do I define myself? What defines me? Where is my identity located? So they're asking John an important question. John, who are you? Where's your identity found? Is it found in being a desert preacher? Is it found in these large crowds that you're gathering? Are you Elijah? Are you the prophet? Where is your identity? And in this moment, John the baptizer, JTB, has the opportunity to be anything he wants to be. He can answer any way he wants to answer. There's a commercial on TV right now of someone going to Las Vegas, and when they're in Vegas, remember whatever happens in Vegas supposedly stays in Vegas, even though things can come back from Vegas. Um, But people are in Vegas, and you see on this commercial a person pretending to be all these different people. They're in their weekend in Vegas. I'm this, I'm that, I'm this person, I'm that person. And in this moment, John the baptizer has the opportunity to be whoever he wants to claim to be. A great speaker, a crowd gatherer, a prophet, a hipster wearing clothes that no one else wears. He can be whatever he wants to be in this moment. But instead, and when you read the text, there's an emphasis implied here. There's a double emphasis. He emphasizes, I'll tell you from the starting point, who I am not. What? We didn't ask you who you are not. We ask you who you are. But doesn't John's answer say everything? John's answer is, it's it's not about me. My identity is not found in me. It's found in who I proclaim. It's found in him. I'm just the voice. I'm just a sinner. Now, this story reminds me of the Old Testament story when God appears to Moses in the burning bush. Remember that story? Moses is on the backside of the desert. He's been removed from the Israelites for 40 plus years. And God appears to him in a burning bush and says to him, you're going to lead my people out of Egypt. And as he's having this conversation with God uh, in the burning bush, Uh, Moses says, well, when I go to these people, who am I going to tell them sent me? And you remember God's response to Moses? You tell them that the great I am, that I am who I am sent you. I am who I am. And the very name of God, I am, means that he's this eternal now, that he's this eternal, omnipotent, all-powerful God who is the eternal great I am. The very name of I am implies that we are not something. He is the great I am. I am not the great I am. And I can't really surrender myself to the great I am until I realize who I am not. That I'm not God. That I'm not the ruler of the universe. That I'm not Lord of my own life. God says, I am who I am, and his very name implies what John says. That implies, I am not. I am not God. Now, we like to pretend and act like we're God. We like to rule and reign in our own hearts and lives and have our own way, and we call that idolatry, that I rule and reign in my own life, my own way. We like to rule and reign over other people's lives, and we like to pretend to be God in other people's lives. But understanding my role in God's economy begins with realizing who I am not. And when I realize who I am not, it keeps me humble. It keeps me humble. Are you Elijah? John. The Old Testament spoke of Elijah preceding the Messiah. Are you Elijah? I am not. By taking the role of Elijah, there was a temptation of celebrity, the desire to be famous. You're Elijah. Everyone's heard of Elijah. Are you Elijah? There's the temptation built into their question of celebrity. 
Are you Elijah? Are you the name that everyone will recognize? Are you the one that's coming before? Are you famous? The phrase that we use in our culture today is that person is YouTube famous or that person is Instagram famous or that person is movie star famous. We are intrigued with being famous. And in this moment, John the baptizer is asked the question, are you famous? Are you Elijah? And he says, I am not. Well, are you the great prophet? The Old Testament, particularly in the book of Deuteronomy, speaks of a great prophet who would precede the Messiah and would be recognized. It was a question of of power, a question of authority. Are you the one that comes with great authority and, and great power to proclaim the coming Messiah? Is that who you are, John? Are you a person of status? Are you a person of power? Are you a person of authority? Again, something that we struggle with, the control issue, the power issue, the authority issue, being in control. And when things get outside of our control, we tend to scramble and shift and try to take control and play that God role in our lives. And in this moment, the baptizer is asked, are you a person of power? Are you the great prophet? And John says, I am not. Man, they are so determined to give John a label, aren't they? They're so determined to pin a title on John, just like us. We're so quick to label, to title. That person's good, that person's bad, that person's known by this. This defines this person's life. We're so quick to assign labels and titles, good and bad. But John's identity was not found in titles. It was found in who he was in Jesus. It is important to recognize who we are not. But their conversation continues. They're not content with John's answer, verse 22. So they said to him, who are you? We need to give an answer to those who sent us. John, you're not being clear with us. We've got to give an answer. What do you say about yourself? Again, another loaded question. John said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Now they had been sent from the Pharisees. John's interrogators need to give some type of response. And so they are insistent. John, show us your resume. Uh, All these riddles that you're speaking about who you're not, That's not going to be a satisfactory answer when we return to those that sent us. We need an explanation to give. Who are you? Show us your resume. Show us your status. Tell us what we can tell other people about you. Again, John's opportunity in this moment is to increase himself. A phrase that he'll pick up on later in John's gospel when he says, I must decrease, but he must decrease increase. And in this moment, John has the opportunity to increase himself. The mic is in his face. People want to hear. The spotlight is on him. Now, I don't know about you, but I know my heart. I know in this moment, if the mic was in Devin's face and Devin had the opportunity and I was John the Baptist, I want to think I would respond properly, but I know how I would probably respond. I'd probably be like, JTB is in the house. It's me. Look at my baptism numbers. Listen to me preach. Look at my crowds. Man, I must be something special. I need to, lo- I need to lead a church growth seminar. Sign people up. Write a book. Speak at a conference. What does John do? He quotes... From the book of Isaiah, he goes to the Bible and he says, Look, I am merely a voice. Not, I'm on the voice. I saw Miley Cyrus is going to be a judge on the voice along with Alicia Keys this time. That's just side information for you to know. John doesn't say, I'm going to be on the voice voice. John says, I am merely a voice. I, I, I don't even have a resume to give you. I'm wearing camel skins. You wouldn't believe what I ate for breakfast. I pulled it out from under a rock. I'm nobody. 
But to quote Isaiah, I'm a voice in the wilderness. I'm merely a voice. Kind of the opposite of what we saw in our prologue series about who Jesus is. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. But unlike the eternal Word, the eternal Logos that we saw in the prologue, John is simply a voice. A voice is temporary. It's fleeting. It's fading. It's here today. It's gone tomorrow. If you're a Christian music fan, it's a wave tossed in the ocean, right? Here today, gone tomorrow. A voice crying in the wilderness. What is the wilderness? It's a desert. It's dry. It's parched. It symbolizes the brokenness and the emptiness of life. It symbolizes the season of life where we are in need of nourishment and water and life. And what John says is, I am a voice out in the desert telling people where to find water. Is there anything more needed in the desert than water. You ever found yourself in the desert of life? You find yourself in a tough place right now in life? Hear me. Hear my voice. Jesus can nourish your thirsty soul. Are you lonely, desperate, discouraged, ready to give up, ready to throw in the towel? You feel like you've, you've reached that dry season of life and you see no oasis, you see no nourishment, you see no spiritual vitality in your life, you, you feel like your prayers are not being heard, that you can't go through another thing and then another thing happens. Do you find yourself in the desert place of life? Are you seeking to quench thirst from the wells of the world and yet they continue to dry up? You seek to find nourishment in fleeting promises, in addictions that cannot satisfy, in relationships that will not provide you eternal satisfaction, and yet you continue to go back to the sand. You continue to go back to the desert to find your nourishment. Listen to my voice. Jesus can solve your thirsty soul. He is in a the desert. What does my voice say? That's an interesting question. What does my voice say to people who are around me that are in the desert of life? Where am I pointing them? What am I saying to them? When they come to me again and again and again, and I've done this again, am I saying, I told you so? Am I saying, you should have known that? Am I saying, why don't you listen? Or am I saying, no matter how dry and thirsty you are, there's a place to find nourishment for your soul. And it is in Jesus and Jesus alone. What is my voice proclaiming? What did John say? He said, said, make straight the way of the Lord. This is a message of preparation, preparing way for the king. In ancient times, it was important when a king would travel for people to go ahead of him and to prepare the way. They would straighten the roads. They would make sure there was no enemies lying ahead of them. They would clear the path for the king. And John simply says, I am a voice preparing the way for Jesus. I am a temporary fleeting voice in my life generation. Isn't that our role? Day in and day out, years, decades, centuries, as they come and go, we are a temporary voice in our generation for this time, for this place, for this location. We are a voice that has been assigned one thing, prepare the way for the king of kings. Because without a voice, people do not hear. And we are to be confident voices. Humble, I am not, but confident. I am a voice pointing and speaking of Jesus and Jesus alone. I'm not pointing to 
self-help guides. I mean, you can go to Barnes and Noble and, and find more than you can ever read. I'm not pointing to seven successful steps to a healthy marriage. I'm not pointing to the little trite statements, and I'm not pointing to temporary matters, and I'm not pointing to a message that says, well, just do better and think harder and try harder and everything will be okay. I'm not pointing to messages that say, eat healthier and be more physically fit and everything will be okay. My voice has to proclaim one thing. There is one source. There is one way to find nourishment for your thirsty soul. And it's not do better and try harder and work harder. It's there is a king, the king of kings. We turn our hearts toward him. We point to Jesus and Jesus alone, and that's what we see in the last part of our text this morning, picking up in verse 25. They ask him, then why are you baptizing? If you are neither the Christ nor Elijah nor the prophet, John answered them, I baptize with water, but among you, listen to the irony here, among you stands one you do not know. Even he who comes after me, the strap of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. These things took place in Bethany across the Jordan where John was baptizing. It's important for us to know who we're not, to know who we are in Jesus, and it's important for us to point people to Jesus and Jesus alone. If you're not the Messiah, if you're not Elijah, if you're not a prophet, John, why are you baptizing? Like, who, who gives you the authority, the right to baptize? Baptism was a sacred ceremony. It was the the rite of passage for a Jewish convert. And there is John the baptizer, baptizing Jew and Gentile alike as they came to hear his message. And the religious elite of his day said to him, what right do you have to invite outsiders into our faith? And I love John's response. It's so classic. It's not about me. It's not about baptism. It's not about authority. It is all about Jesus. And in the midst of your concern about religious rituals and who approves and who does not approve, you have missed that there is one standing among us who is greater than any of us. We're not even worthy to perform the most menial task. Even servants in that day would not stoop to untie a person's shoes. It was the lowest task of all. And John says, amidst your concerns and your squabbling and your religious rituals and your concerns over who is in and who is out and who I am and who I am not, you have missed that there is one standing among us that I'm not even worthy to untie his sandals. John speaks of the greatness of Jesus. We, we spend a lot of time trying to be great. But Jesus is great simply because of who he is. He is God himself. He is the word incarnate. He does not seek to obtain greatness. He does not seek to earn greatness. He simply is great. And John reminds us, we have been invited into a relationship with one whose shoes we are not even worthy to untie. You know what that speaks to? It speaks not only to the greatness of the Son of God, but it speaks to his humility. That he was willing to enter our space. And the fact that Jesus is even standing among us speaks to the extent that God goes to bridge the gap between greatness and commonness. And what we'll see next Sunday is that this preeminent one, this great one, humbled himself in order to take away our sin, to become the ultimate sacrifice. He is great. He is a great Savior. He is a great forgiver. He is a great 
redeemer. He is a great healer. He is a great restorer. He is a great king. And we point people to him and him alone. There's a father and son that were making their way through a big city, and they were building skyscrapers in this big city. And this little boy had never been to the big city before, and they were visiting the city. And he looked up high onto one of the skyscrapers, and he pulls his dad's arm, and he's Dad looks down, and the little boy points up, and he says, Daddy, why are those little boys standing on top of that giant building? The father looks up and realizes the distance of the skyscraper caused the men to look very small. And he says to his son, Son, those aren't boys. Those are grown men. And the little boy thinks about that for a minute, and then he says, Daddy, I guess when they reach heaven, there won't be anything left of them. Isn't that our story in life? That the closer we are drawn to Jesus, that the more we fall in love with Jesus, that the more we point people to Jesus, the less of us there is that he is making us more like him. John, who are you? Who are you? Devin, who are you? Who are you? How do you define yourself? What is your role? What are you seeking? What is your life mission? What is your purpose? Who are you? I can tell you, who I'm not, I'm not the Christ. I'm not a prophet. I'm not the great one. And recognizing who I'm not keeps us humble. I can tell you who I am. I'm not the great one, but I can point people to the great one. I'm not the light, but I am a witness to the light. I am a voice here today, gone tomorrow, a fading, fleeting voice in a dry and broken place, pointing people to Jesus. And based on who I am, I can proclaim a message of confidence in who he is. I, I can tell you who I'm not. I can tell you who I am, and I can tell you who he is. He is Jesus. He is the great one. And have I mentioned no matter what desert you're in, He is near. And He will provide nourishment to your thirsty soul. As we've said in the Belief Project from week one, John has one purpose, to proclaim who Jesus is and that by proclaiming who He is that you and I might believe. Will you believe in him? Will you rest in him? Will you trust in him? And will we perform our roles? The voice crying in the desert, pointing people to Jesus. This week, this week, remember who you're not. That'll keep you humble. Remember who you are a witness to the light, that will give you confidence. And remember who he is. He is the King of Kings.